the company behind the Morgalab Fantasy RPG tabletop game. And Jason Carl, who is CEO of By Night Studios. He's been working in and with games most of his adult life at Wizards of the Coast, Xbox Game Studios, and Wonderland Seattle. And he's also a freelance RPG writer with White Wolf. And today he's also the producer for Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition for White Wolf. So thanks so much for joining us today. Hello yeah. from Sweden. Hi from the UK. I made it. Sorry about that. My internet died at the worst moment. Welcome back. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I wanted to start us off with, you know, what, why is ambiance important, uh, and and what does it add? Do you want me? Uh, we could start with Ed. Uh, sure. Um, so ambiance. Why is it important? Um, uh, actually, it's it's funny. Um, uh, Jason and I were just speaking right before the uh, uh, the. Um, panel, that's the word I'm looking for, right before the panel started we were actually just talking about ambiance um, as pertains to rules anyway, and part of uh, a role playing experience in my opinion is expressing the themes that you want to uh, show as part of the session that you're playing. So if it's a horror session or if it's suspense, then the ambiance can be absolutely vital. Um, equally if it's more light hearted then having a, a, a more sort of um, open ambiance is is also very useful. So, um, you know, as an example, I have a uh, game that I've created called Era Lias, uh, which is about adventurers who are sort of not actually adventurers. They go to taverns and they tell their tales. And I actually know of a group of players who literally go down to a specific pub which has exactly the right kind of ambiance, um, and they go ahead and play that game right there in order to achieve the kind of feel that they want to from the game. So, yeah, uh, why is it important? I hope that answers the question. I think so. Um, well, one of you, uh, one of the other panelists, want to tackle that one, Jason, John. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think I agree with uh, I agree with that. But I think there are some additional reasons why ambiance is probably more important now than it was when some of us started uh, in this hobby. And that is that um, games have become uh, a participatory entertainment format uh, for people who are very accustomed to enjoying a high level of production values in their other entertainment: video games, television, movies, board games, even trading card games. And in order to um, evoke the same kinds of emotions and uh, investment and buy-in from our players, um, improving the ambiance uh, at the table is uh, a good way to do that and make sure that they're getting the same sort of um, entertainment value out of it that they would in other media. Did we lose John? Hello, John. Hey, I'm still here. Um, just taking care of some stuff. I'm in and out of the panel. I'm bouncing back and forth between that and running the shop at, uh, at the same time. Um, ambience, yeah, just at the uh, at the game table, is actually going to hold a significant part in any real event because you can have, as you know, especially for a store, if you're having large events, you can have multiple people rolling in. But if you don't have the right ambience in the right setting. It's really not going to be memorable, and it's not really going to—it's not going to stick with the players. And you're going to have a lot of people that, right, they would come back, play again, you know, actually become more dedicated to whatever game they're being introduced to. Where uh, so it's—it's it's a good—it's a good staple to have to help keep people coming back to the uh, to the industry and to the community. How do you overcome those limitations, John, in a in a retail environment? You've got distractions. Um, you can't control your lighting. What do you What do you do to create ambiance in a in a shop situation? Well, we actually have LED lights throughout the entire shop that are wow. uh, that's actually the smart lights, so they can be adjusted and changed, you know, at will through one switch setting. Um, and then at the same time, we also have speakers run throughout every one of the game rooms as well as the main area. Kind of a backtrack. I don't know if it's overpowering me or if y'all can hear it. Um, you know, currently, right now, but uh, we've got that running constantly through the shop the whole time. 
so that way regardless of whether people are playing magic dungeons and dragons or whatever it may be you know they've got kind of a, a an undertone uh, foundation laid there that's that's really interesting actually I'm uh, I'm wondering what uh, what you guys think about uh, you know if you're if you're playing a game at a sort of a large uh, role playing convention we we have a few of them in the in the UK and if you're a GM sat there uh, trying to uh, trying to run a game that's maybe a horror game or something and uh, you know obviously there are ten tables around you of all people yelling and shouting how how, how do you go ahead and and think about the ambiance at, at that stage I'm interested in what you guys think. It's one of the more difficult situations, right? Uh, we were all, I, was, I don't know if you were, were at Gen Con this year, but um, the tabletop gaming areas are very busy, of course, uh, and very loud. Um, for White Wolf, we had a separate gaming area so that we could run Vampire 5th Edition tabletop playtests uh, slightly apart from um, the rest of the convention, which helped a little bit. And we dimmed the lights, and that also helped. But it was very challenging, you're right. I saw some of the uh, storytellers, the game masters at the table, try a couple of easy techniques uh, to increase the ambiance. Um, one storyteller had everybody lean in really close and try to form as smallest group as possible. In fact, he took the table away and had them sit in a circle uh, in chairs around together to get as close as possible um, to help a little bit. Another uh, decided that um, the group would stand up at certain moments during the action and they would leave the room and go someplace quieter and that helped. But when you're not in control of the environment, I'm not sure that there's much you can do to improve the ambiance because ambiance is all about controlling the environment, environment to create yeah. a certain effect. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I actually, the reason I asked the question is I actually run a lot of games at conventions. Um, and uh, what, I, what I've actually had to do is choose the games and choose the sessions quite carefully so that they're more of the frantic, the, you know, the, the kind of ambiance that you already have from being at a convention with everyone pushing around and so on. Trying to do something that's actually a horror game where you're sort of sneaking around and you've got the suspense, I, just, I think you'd really, really struggle to achieve that. It's a little tougher, and so if you're going to play to the strength of, of the existing environment, choosing games that match the, the frantic, louder uh, environment of the convention seems pretty smart. Mm -hmm. It'd be difficult to generate the right, um, as you said, suspense and dread of Call of Cthulhu or a vampire game uh, at the convention, but something like Dungeons and Dragons or Werewolf might be really appropriate. I mean, also another thing is when you're not in control of the event, the basic locale of what's going on, um, one thing that I find that helps is if you're running a horror or, you know, some sort of, you know, some sort of high suspense theme, you know, mystery or whatever it may be, uh, scheduling it later in the day, you know, towards, you know, everybody's coming in, it's dark outside. So if they step outside for a break or something, it's dark on the outside. So it kind of carries that ambience from the table out technically have to affect the lighting or anything it's just one small thing that you can do in scheduling that would help out and and if you're lucky really you good. might end up uh, a little like sweden um out there jason where um you know the the light looks very unnatural anyway so you uh, and i've i've experienced this in a few in a few venues for uh, uk conventions mm -hmm. where the light is very very unnatural so when you're not relying on windows and natural light anymore suddenly mm -hmm. you know it's 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 a completely different environment Oh, sure. I think that's a good advice. Mm. Now, what about when we are in control of the environment? What are your What are your, some of your favorite techniques? I um, Who uses music? Does anybody use music? Oh, yeah, I, I use music. I also happen to have a member of my team who is really into sound design. Um, so he actually creates sort of soundscapes for certain bits and pieces, uh, which we actually have uh, given out uh, to Kickstarter backers of of some of our stuff on on previous campaigns uh you know things like oh this is this is what the ambiance is in this particular kind of location it's an alien spaceship which is full of water because it's aquatic aliens for example here's some here's some sound design that you might hear when you're in that location which then gives you this uh you know this this instant leg up um on visualizing what it is that you're you're going to be experiencing have either of you used soundscape uh, sorry sirenscape 
I'm aware of Sir Sirenscape. Um, actually, uh, my uh, <laughs> my my uh, my friend Leo, he uh, he likes to um, he likes to do better than Sirenscape. Uh, he definitely believes that they've got a very good quality product, and it's it's the bar that he's trying to beat personally. I've used Sirenscape a couple times. I was going to say, what, for folks who don't know, what is Sirenscape? Huh? Sirenscape is a, one of several professional software uh, programs that um, deliver high quality uh, sound tracks uh, created specifically for role playing games. So uh, the, uh, the fantasy soundtrack might come with the um, background ambiance of taverns. Uh, or because that's caverns. a common element. Or, or caverns. Um, you know, uh, uh, well constructed elvish flashing. dungeon or yeah a uh, battle yeah mm -hmm. um the the, the, uh... the one thing i would say about sirenscape is uh they're pretty much it's not entirely true but they're they're non-fantasy genres what they offer is a bit limited uh in my experience the sci-fi in particular i'm a sci-fi guy they're sci-fi they've only got about 20 you know sort of 20 options and they're fairly sort of generic We've talked about lighting yeah. and music. Music. Do you make your own soundtracks? I often do that when I'm running Vampire or another World of Darkness game. I like to mix a soundtrack that um, is appropriate to the themes of the game that I'm running at the table, but also the overall themes of the of the game line. Does anybody else do that? Make your own music? Yeah, with the Morgulad fantasy role playing game. Uh, anytime that we run any demos of any adventures. We've actually got a few uh, few basic soundtracks that uh, just create ambience, um, and they can be triggered through. Uh, I actually control everything via my uh, mobile device, tablet, phone, or whatever. Yeah, right. Uh, so while I'm running demos, you know, I can trigger it, and it'll play throughout the entire story, uh, whatever the room ambience is for that area. That way, I don't have to rely entirely on uh, on pre-made stuff like Sirenscape. Yeah, actually, um, I had one person who actually drew that into his character. Um, he, he decided he was going to be a sci-fi bard, right? So, uh, literally, he got out Spotify, and he was allowed to play a song, and based on listening to the song, the, the party would get a bonus of some description. So, you know, he was only allowed to use each song once. So, um, you know, it was, it was quite an interesting sort of pick and mix um, for that particular occasion. Uh, you know, using, How'd that using... work? How did that work out? Did the players enjoy it? Oh yeah, they they loved the idea. It was uh, you know, uh, oh, I'm playing Eye of the Tiger, so you know, we're all we're all kind of rushing into battle and we're all, you know, we're all doing great. And yeah. and now I'm playing um, I don't know, the the Song of Healing from uh, Legend of Zelda. So, you know, we're we're oh, now all, we're now all healing up or whatever. It was it was good fun. It was a really good idea that that uh, really really came off. The most interesting use of music in a in a role-playing game that I've seen recently it was a uh, is on Twitch. Uh, Satine Phoenix is running a new Twitch D and D show, Sirens of the Realms. Each of her players is a bard, and they all have an instrument that they play at the table. Someone's got a ukulele or a flute or a percussion instrument or a triangle or whatever. And these bards are um, are traveling throughout the land, playing in in taverns and and pubs. And whenever they do a jam session, they actually play the instruments at the table. I was blown away. It was amazing. Never seen that before. It's a really interesting. Um, I asked my players about that, and they said, "No, no, we're not, not going to do that." But they were very impressed. That's some serious immersion. That is. That's uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I was really impressed. My hats off to him. Is there in, in sort of selecting soundscapes? Are there in, in audio clips to include? Is there any any that you've seen people make or that you you know about selecting just the right one or if, you know any do's or don'ts i suppose i i always recommend with all ambiance and whether you're talking about music or lighting or soundtracks or costumes or props do, try not to overdo it if the game becomes about the ambiance it loses uh, focus or it's it can no lose focus players, right yeah uh yeah. conversely now i'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth right uh, vampire writer who knew um, I think that uh, the game should have as much ambiance as the players can handle or they want it's probably something that you want to talk about uh, beforehand with your players 
I think in terms of actually selecting something that you sort of want to use, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I I agree with the first half of of of, uh, of what was said there in particular uh, by Jason, and um, I I think that um, if you choose something that uh, brings a certain feeling in you, it's quite likely that the other players are going to begin to visualize a similar thing. So sit down, think about what it is that you're trying to achieve with this ambiance, with this, um, you know, with this soundtrack or, or piece of music, and what what you need to feel, and then you can go on numerous sites, uh, whatever it works, whatever works for you, and choose something that makes you feel the right thing. I, I would always say, if you feel it, it's probably in the right area. I like the idea that if you're inspired and you're you're getting energy from the from what you've chosen, that your players will too. I think that's I think that's pretty wise. All right. And another big thing about it is that with any type of audio ambience that you're adding in, uh, is that um, you want it to be a foundation <laughs> to fill, you know, to to build on. You know, so that's just like going back to what Jason said. You know, you don't want to overpower. You don't want to be just basically turning into a one man show. Uh, lay a foundation so that way it, you know can invoke those feelings that you're looking for yeah i strongly agree with that you gotta you gotta make sure that the players are still the center of it and yeah you want them to feel the right thing but uh and and both of the other guys have said this already um yeah if it becomes about the ambiance rather than about the players you're no longer actually sort of playing a role-playing game you're you're sort of giving a concert Have any of you ever used sort of musical cues for something that once it happens in the soundscape, it, it, it triggers something in the game? Yeah, I, I, I did once. Um, mm -hmm. What happened was uh, it was it was actually I was using the I was doing a sci fi game. So I, I'm excusing myself here. I was using the soundtrack of um, Lilac Wars uh, for the um, for the. Uh, planet the underwater planet which i forget its name now um and yeah when you get to a certain point you actually hear the battle begin um so yeah you know i'm uh, we're, we're going through we're going through the thing and i timed this really carefully and practiced it and i was reading this you know uh well speaking this description um that i'd rehearsed for about 30 seconds you know about where you're looking around and you know you're seeing all this sea life around you and so on and then that's the moment the, the assassin strikes and tries to kill the guy that you're protecting. Nice. I think, um, I think a lot of uh, storytellers, a lot of GMs have their favorite musical cues or moments that they like to play habitually. I have a friend who, when he is um, running fantasy games, uh, he cues up the um, battle theme to Conan the Barbarian, the old uh, 1982 movie, or he will put on Carmina Burana, uh, to uh, get the blood stirring whenever there's a, a, a soaring battle charge happening, and I think that that a lot of our a lot of players um, have favorite key pieces of music from media, from favorite TV shows and movies, and and uh, uh, other media as well, video games um, that I think um, create immediate images in their heads. They're almost audio shorthand. If you hear the Conan theme, you know there's going to be a big bloody battle coming up, and we all know it. It's going to happen. When you hear Ride of the Valkyries, something soaring and majestic is about to occur. And I think using popular music like that can um, be a great um, kind of shorthand at the table to get people ready to uh, do a little foreshadowing to let them know what's coming up and to, to get them excited. My players know that if I, whenever I play the, the theme, for, uh, the uh, Ennio Morricone music from the movie The Thing, John Carpenter's horror film, they know to get the dice out. Something scary is going to happen. It's, it's time to start looking over your shoulder. The number one thing with it is just to make sure that whenever you do an audio cue like that, that you actually have them properly labeled and organized on your device, whatever you're running them, because you really don't want a big, uh, you don't want a big battle with you know really happy jaunty. <laughs> Why does that sound like the voice of experience? <laughs> 15, you know, 15 to 20 plus years of, of running games, you know, there was a time where we were playing some uh, futuristic stuff. We had just a random mix down of stuff thrown in a media player. And uh, one battle started off with very uh, 
high paced, uh, you know, very happy techno music. And uh, it was not a serious battle at all. So, uh, <laughs> it turned very comical see, very quickly. You know, how many hours I'm supposed to be working? So it's one of those things you just got to make sure that everything's properly labeled and organized so that way uh, you don't slip in um, and completely wreck the ambience that so you're building. Important safety tip. Label your software, people. Yeah, la label your tracks carefully. And it's great. Yeah. yeah. We've talked a lot about audio and a little about, about lighting. Does anybody else like to use props at their table? I know I do. I like to build maps and jewelry and um, or hand out weaponry or, or um, other physical items to give to the players at key moments. Yeah, I actually um, I actually have for era liars. Um, I literally have one around here. Um, I, I have coins. Um, so I actually went out. There's a, there's some guys. Uh, they do dwarven coins, and I've absolutely forgotten what their company name is. It's gone. Um, I think it's campaign coin, isn't it? No, no, I don't think so. Different company. Yeah, it's a different company. I ran into them at UK Games Expo, and I, I fell in love with their coins. And and the you know the ones they made me are about that big. Um, and they've got a custom design on for you know that fits in with this. And literally, they are you know they are marked as one gold of Yarnolf. And and yeah, what I do when I'm starting an Era Lies game is I literally hand everyone three gold, and then you know they have to buy their drink or whatever and so on before they tell the story. So we're we're handing gold pieces around. You know, not too much gold changes hands, so it doesn't get silly. But um, you know, it's it's a little bit of yeah, okay. So this is this is all I've got in the world, and and I'm handing you a third of what I have. Yeah, I, I love doing that. I love I love being able to sort of hand someone something and say, okay, this is this is your thing, and bear in mind that as you use it, it's going. You're losing it. Yeah, you clearly love <laughs> another thing. What? Sorry, John. Uh, I was just going to say one thing that we do at the shop to try and uh, try and build on that is like we try to like basically it. give buffs and bonuses to no, players no. that actually do you know not really bring too heavy into props but just some something themed along the lines of what we're doing. <laughs> um, so like for instance, we had uh, Magic the Gathering, we had uh, you know the card game. That whenever they released it, um, it's themed around pirates and dinosaurs. So we did a costume contest, you know, a costume party type deal where everybody who showed up in costume themed around the uh, the event got like five extra starting life. You know, it's nothing too outrageous, but it's just something that helps to pull everybody in time into the event, time into the game. Yeah, props, you know, definitely plays a big part, yeah. and uh, it, it winds up creating a lot of comedy at the, the same time. Yeah. I, I actually remember one of my players uh, was the was the first to actually do that at my table um, in recent years, and uh, he was playing a, a sort of a slightly odd alien who believed that he was Clint Eastwood. Um, so he, he literally did turn up and, and wore a poncho, you know? Um, and uh, and he just sat at the table wearing the poncho, and that was it. That was that was exactly it. But he'd sit there and wear that poncho. And we, we were, whenever we turned to look at him, we were bursting out laughing um, because it was so perfect. I mean, that was exactly what his character was like. He he'd just wear it as if it was normal attire, despite the fact you know this is clearly a, a complete anachronism. This is a futuristic world, and wherever he got the idea that this was a thing, you know, is is thousands of years ago. I think that's awesome. I love it when players will bring a signature item or wear a signature piece of clothing to uh, to the gaming table. Um, I come from a LARPing background. I've written a lot of LARP um, material and, and played in a lot of uh, LARP games. And um, sometimes my my table becomes a kind of a LARP tabletop, LARP top uh, situation. And I love it when that happens, when players become so involved and enthused that they stand up and will actually um, be so immersed in their characters that they'll act out dialogue or yeah. scenes rather than just sit and roll dice or, or narrate um, through a third person. Doesn't always happen, but I like to encourage it. And that that can be an immersive element of its own, although it's a it's a pretty special technique. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and actually, the uh, one thing that I do is uh, I run a lot of the same session um, uh, for my sci-fi game. It's actually the one I mentioned earlier that's quite frantic. And it starts with you run into a room and the door slams shut behind you. And I like to bang my hand on the table, right? The door slams shut. 
Um, and then someone points their gun at you and they yell, FREEZE! You know, uh, uh, and people immediately go, oh, okay, okay. You know, I'm, I'm at a convention here and, and, you know, this this is happening now. And, and it, as a GM, you can help encourage people to have that little bit of extra immersion, that little bit of extra addition to the ambiance by doing a little bit. And again, it's, it's like we said earlier, it's, it's all about not doing so much that you're overwhelming anyone, but enough that you're encouraging, you're encouraging them, you're enabling them to be able to do that. And we talked a little bit about earlier about how it was difficult to, you know, get that immersion experience at a, at a convention. Do you find props uh, are useful for that? Uh, definitely. If, you, if you're at a convention and having to compete with noise and interruptions and the loudspeaker and the, the or lighting that's too bright, handing out a map or a coin or anything simple, anything at all helps. Any, any immersion is better than uh, no immersion, I think, and therefore any ambiance better than none. I've those actually, are my choices. <clears throat> I've actually had a super mixed bag at conventions. Um, sometimes people react really, really badly to being handed an item. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they're not interested. They don't want to use it. They don't want to have it. More often than not, I, I agree. It, it usually goes quite well, but I've actually had some really negative reactions. It's surprising. Because, yeah, to me that little bit of extra immersion should be a good thing, but people don't what always act quite the way you expect. What was their objection? They what didn't what ever about say it made them uncomfortable or, or diminished the experience for them? They didn't ever say specifically. I, I, I'm under the impression this was someone who was sort of couldn't help picking it up and thinking, okay, well, uh, 50 people have touched this over the last weekend. I'm not sure I really <laughs> want to be handling this. Um, I actually, I actually carry some uh, some hand sanitizer, which I spread over my dice, uh, sort of at, at any point during the day yeah. when we're not actually playing, um, and give people the chance to mm, not worry about, <laughs> not worry about that too much. And also, one thing, as you know, on that topic is, they're new, are still kind of butting into it. You know, you've got some that are just going to jump and dive right into everything they're going to take on the ambiance they're going to take up props they're going to play with you know just enjoy everything and then there's some that are a little more reserved you know they, they they're still a little bit more skeptical maybe they've got anxiety of, of how they're going to be perceived by everybody and uh you know that's you know that, that's a legitimate thing um usually when we're doing convention themed stuff uh i'll usually because you can't control the audio you can't control the lighting usually i'll just focus on like uh terrain if I do use props, then I'll usually use, you know, just like a, a wax sealed note or something, you know, I'll just prep something for each one of the pre-generated characters, have enough of them so that way uh, we just hand out a different one each time. And a note's inexpensive, quick and easy to make, so that way, you know, it's not, you know, 50 swords that I'm having to make to pass out or something, you know. John, you, you just raised a great point, I think. We've been talking about ambiance as really a, a, a tool in simulation in trying to make the table environment feel more like the environment that we're narrating in the role-playing game. But you just mentioned terrain, which has nothing yeah. to do with, with um, environmental simulation at all. And so I have no opinion. I'm just kind of curious about what you and, uh, and our fellow panelists think. Is, is terrain part of ambiance? I think it can be, you know, because not every game not really is, is question, solely you know. dedicated to, you know, I mean, I think it can be, it's one of those things that you don't want to get so hardcore into it that every game is dependent on it. However, just having, you know, like a map or something just laying out on the table, you know, can, even if it's never used, it's just the fact that it's there. It, it helps kind of lay yet again, just like music, you know, it just helps lay a foundation. Um, so like, you know, I'm not saying go full, you know, dungeon, uh, I'm not even sure what it is, uh, the Dwarven Stone. I'm not saying go full Dwarven, you know, Dwarven Forge on it and, and drop 15 grand to build a modular terrain system. But, you know, just a simple map can help out a lot. So what I do, um, actually, with all of my convention games is I have a printed map. Um, and I laminate it. Um, and I either use miniatures or I use uh, a board pen. To literally draw, you are roughly here on the map. You know, it's not got hexes. It's not. It's not so you can count the exact distance. 
But, you know, when you when you say, okay, this map, you see this map, it's about the size of this room, you know, and convention halls are usually big enough that you can do that. It's about the size of this room, and people then have sort of a vague idea. I think, I, I agree, I think it can be. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that, that was touched on by Jason a minute ago um, was, um, is it too much for an individual player? That's one of the things that I find quite interesting at conventions, is you're going to get a mixed bag of players, right? Some of them are going to be gung-ho, 100% ready to do absolutely anything. They know what role-playing is, they're happy about it, they're comfortable doing it. Some of them are going to be brand new to role-playing, they've never done it before, they aren't really sure what to expect, they aren't really sure, they don't want to humiliate themselves. And, um, you know, I think, I think the GM giving a lead in those situations is one of the really, really useful things that a GM can do. Um, you know, like my freeze, uh, like having a map on the ground and saying, okay, look, here's, here's where people are. And when they go, oh, well, how many, how many spaces can I move? You go, oh, no, 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 you can just, you can move about this far, you know, about that distance, um, you know, and, and, you know, it, it, it makes it less, okay, well, I have to get out to take measure and measure this kind of the war game style, it becomes more a, okay, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, I, I understand what space I'm looking at. What's this thing here? Oh, that's a computer console. Oh, okay then. Cool. Okay. And you start to see the, you see the things click into place as they have for you as the GM, because you designed the session. You, um, you see the things click into place for the players as you give them what they need. So what's um, what do you what do you all wish you could have for ambiance that you don't have? I mean, I got a wish list that's really long, but I'm kind of curious about what you think. A full castle. Yeah. <laughs> Siege machine. Not even gonna lie. <laughs> just just one huge castle, you know, with an actual you know just main great hall with just huge tables that you just sit down. <laughs> At that point, why would you sit? You'd have a yeah, just LARP it out. <laughs> just LARP it out. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I'm I'm living for the day when the, when we get the holodeck, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the yes. developments in, in immersive entertainment that are coming out of out of Hollywood right now, but immersive entertainment is a kind of role playing that is becoming more and more popular. Its roots go way back, probably earlier than LARP. And it's become commercially successful, and um, even in, in we're seeing TV shows made about it. Westworld is immersive. It's a it, Westworld is about a LARP. It's about role playing. And uh, I'm 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 living for the day when we get the holodeck, where we can completely simulate our environments for our role playing games around us, without you know, leaving the comfort of our of our living room. It may look like my 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 old couch from IKEA, but really. It's the it's the command deck of the enterprise. I swear. So um, I can't wait till we get there. To me, that's the ultimate goal of of, of role playing game ambiance. But is well, that too much? Is that is that too weird? Is it no longer role playing at that point? Do you think? No, no. I think um, I think you can you can do it in some situations and not in others. I think there are places where having that level of ambiance would actually be sort of almost detrimental. Um, imagine that you are. Um, okay, so you're on the bridge of the Enterprise, and you're flying around the Enterprise, even you're in a space battle. Perfectly fine, you're in one place, you're expecting that to happen. Now, you're, uh, and, and you're even just sat there pushing buttons, or, you know, you're rolling dice, it is near enough, right? You're sat on, at the table. But now, you're in the middle of a battle. And you've got swords clashing around you, you've got, you got, you know, the literal people, you know, running around doing things. And you're sat at a table, to me, that... You know, I, I suspect that would begin to be jarring. You know, that, okay, my I'm trying to imagine my character in this situation, and I am completely disconnected for that, from that, sat here, I've got a handful of dice and I'm rolling them on the table, while there are people over here fighting with swords. It, 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 so it would... what you're saying is, uh, I'm going to, um, what I'm hearing, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're saying that in those situations, um, it would stop being theater of the mind. Right, we would no longer be imagining the action, which is part of role playing as we know it, and we'd be watching a movie. 
which would be incongruous with you know rolling our dice and, and checking our character sheets. It, it's not exactly that. It, it's it that's sort of partially it. What I'm what I'm really saying is that if the ambiance is so realistic around you that you can see the things going on, and your character obviously isn't part of that ambiance, you're trying to imagine your character within that ambiance, then, you know, you you are clearly within this amazing, you know, surround view, and yet you are sat doing something totally incongruous with the situation that you're in. And I think, makes to sense. me, that might break some of the immersion. I mean, but this is where we're talking about how far is too far, you know, with, with ambiance. And to me, that that would be one step too far in certain situations. As I said, if you're on the bridge of the Enterprise and you'd all more or less be sat around anyway, you know, uh, pressing buttons and you're rolling dice and and writing stuff down instead, sure, fine. I feel like there's there's a thin line somewhere and it can best be, you know, kind of encapsulated from my point of view with like an analogy from a Ren Faire. You know, you're in a Ren Faire, you're in this, you know, makeshift tavern, you're sitting at the table, you've got your character sheets, and you're playing theater of the mind inside the tavern. Nothing's really going on. But the moment you step outside of that tavern into the community of the Renaissance Festival where everybody's in full guard, full role-playing, full action, at that point, there's a clear difference between the character you are portraying the individual inside of that area. So it at that point it breaches and there's just like a thin line there where it crosses over from theater of the mind to essentially LARPing. And so it's one of those things you got to kind of be careful. You kind of walk on a tightrope there. But the castle is okay. You still want your castle. Well, the castle is ambiance. The castle is your sat in a dungeon, right? Now we're back to ambiance. Awesome. Yeah, the building is ambiance. The people change it. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to be clear. (laughs) Uh, for, for, for me, I, I, I didn't yet answer. I'm a sci-fi guy, right? Um, and rather than be predictable and say, you know, I want a giant spaceship to sit in. Actually, what I'd like <laughs> is, is some gadgets. Like, something that... I mean, it, it would almost be doable. Uh, in fact, much like a castle would almost be doable. Like, it's physically possible. But, you know, um, imagine, imagine, you know, you're in a sci-fi game and your character sheet looks like a heads-up display... Um, which which you have sat next to you on the table on a glass tablet, right? That's just a sheet of glass, and it's like a heads-up display, and you're, you're tapping away on it to to look at whatever, and, and it gives you the number, and you, you roll your dice and whatever. But, you know, it, it, would be, it would be a possible thing to achieve. That's, that's the kind of thing where I, would, where I would start looking at and going, well, I mean, obviously I could also go, yeah, yeah, I want, I want a starship. But, um... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that I would love to to sort of be able to have for my group, because, um, you know, that kind of thing, you know, it, it it helps people get closer to what their character is seeing. And in, in my opinion, that's sort of the whole point of ambiance, right? It's, it's what we've talked about, the sound, the visuals, and so on. It's getting you that slight step closer each time to what your character is experiencing. What do we think it does for us? Uh, I, I think that, um, at least for my players, the ambiance um, helps them become more invested, more immersed. It definitely enhances their enjoyment of the experience. Um, it creates emotional reactions in them, which I really, I really appreciate. Um, and I think that um, it makes them more willing to um, continue to invest in the future. Uh, the, uh, the players who you mentioned some players at conventions who don't care for um, the, some of the techniques that we've been talking about. Have you ever encou- encountered that at a you know, private gaming table where players just didn't want to, they didn't want music, they didn't want lighting, props, or anything? That they didn't get anything from the experience? Uh, John, please, please go ahead. I've had quite a few, um, and I noticed mostly it was it was with older players some of the older players um uh, you know i started out with advanced dungeons and dragons uh, that was one of the first role-playing games i ever played uh, i was uh, the youngest how, guy how old the- is older here i'm, I'm like 108 so careful <laughs> i'm talking about guys that are you know like in their 40s and 50s at this point you know and so these uh these guys were you know and you got to also realize you know we're in bible belt you know southern louisiana you know very down south um so 
guys that are really invested in this macho mindset and so whenever it comes to role-playing games they're already kind of breaking a stereotype and breaking into you know territory that's a little bit uncharted for them and so the first time they ever teach me to play advanced dungeons and dragons hey this is awesome you know i'm one of those i go all in you know i don't halfway do something so whenever i start running it the first time you know i start incorporating music props you know character costumes just anything i can get my hands on you know i'm, I'm just eating everything up the older guys were just like, hey, you know, you need to tone it back a little bit. You know, we don't really, you know, we're not, we're not into playing with the props or anything like that. And so I noticed that it was more about, they were more focused about their outward appearance and how they were going to be perceived by other people in the, you know, in the, in the community around here. And uh, some people, you know, clearly uh, have that anxiety and, you know, that's a valid thing. I'm okay. not going to force it on them. But, yeah. uh, but I just noticed a clear distinction between, you know, the older group and some of the younger groups that are coming up. That's pretty interesting. At 108, I'm perfectly happy to stick on a funny hat and trust to luck, but I understand that's not a, <laughs> not a thing for everybody. I had never thought about that. Thing too. <laughs> yeah, I, I generally agree with John. It's it's almost always, and, and I don't necessarily agree that it's always the older players, but it's almost always the players who are worried about how they're perceived by other people. Um, and as, as John says, that's totally valid. There is nothing wrong with any personality type. Um, and some people I know are a bit concerned about how, how other people see them and, you know, what stories might get told. And then others are totally willing to go ahead and put a poncho on and sit at the table for four hours. Um, and, and I like to welcome anyone to my table, whichever category they fall into. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that... I think that this is something that is probably getting something I encounter less and less as time goes on. Um, I um, I run a lot of convention, uh, run a lot of conventions, which well, run games at a lot of conventions, I should say, which have cosplay, and I find that there is almost certainly a you know a correlation, which is not surprising given what we've just said uh, between cosplay and uh, and a willingness to. Uh, sort of become more engaged, more immersed, more, you know, uh, willing to use the props. Oh, I agree with you completely. I think we're entering this weird period of convergence where the traditional tabletop role playing, live action role playing, cinematics, audio, cosplay are all creating um, and changing the, the, the form of entertainment in ways that, I mean, a decade from now, I don't even know if we're going to recognize it. It's going to be really cool. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, the thing that's allowed this is the fact that it's so easy to do now. You know, um, it's it's so easy to go ahead and get a soundtrack off the internet or, or to go ahead and, and even build your own or whatever you want. It, it's so simple to do. You know, a, anyone with, you know, even a, a low level of technical skills can, can just go out and do that. And I think that that means that it opens up opportunities for people to more widely uh, produce this experience that perhaps, you know, 20 years ago would only have been achieved by someone who happened to be a sound designer as their full-time job. That's a hugely, that's a really important point, I think. Accessibility um, and ubiquity is probably changing it, maybe even faster than we, than we understand. Um, in your, in your convention experiences, are you, um, uh, we talked earlier about how we couldn't control the environment and how it was very difficult to set the right tone. Um, what are you learning at conventions that you're bringing back to your own table in terms of creating atmosphere? That's an interesting one. Um, co convention games tend to be a lot more whimsical. Um, so what, what I'm really learning are don'ts rather than do's, um, if you know what I mean. You know, don't... Uh, yeah, I mean, there are some things that, that work for both, right? Uh, the freeze is a great, great example that I keep coming back to because it is. Um, it's an easy thing that GM can do, but um, equally, you know, you, you can have the NPCs do silly things and you can act out silly things at a convention, whereas it's more likely, in my experience, that a, uh, a sort of a private game, if you'll allow me to put it that way, um, is going to be more serious, more, you know, people are more invested in their characters when they've made them. And uh, having the same kind of 
gung ho sort of this is utterly ridiculous and it's supposed to be utterly ridiculous and let's revel in that because that's the fun bit um tends to be something that that actually ends up being a negative to the ambiance in a in a more sort of secluded game where you can control the environment i think the most important thing i learned um running games and conventions that i brought back to my own table in terms of ambiance is that um if you take away the table in order to um pull people together and increase the uh, the intimacy of the experience you should probably think about where you're going to roll the dice i was wondering about that what what you were saying about this this gm that had done that i was sat there going yes. okay okay seems, i can see that so i can clever. see why and it, i was going it seems um... so clever we had to improvise well, yeah, I mean, that's that's when you get a, a dice tray. There's a brilliant producer of dice trays out there, uh, all rolled up, who do dice trays. Uh, you stick it on a you stick it on a hardback copy of your book. Go, you're fine. <laughs> I've got my all rolled up right here. Ah, oh, there you go. I love these things. Well, that's, there's also decks of cards that have randomly oh, generated fantastic. dice. On. Yeah, that's that's become oh, really a thing are. in this past uh, past couple of years. We really are spoiled. We live in this golden age of uh, role playing where we have access to um, to things fairly inexpensively and easily that we just never had before. Yeah, I mean, uh, even oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, no, e even speaking as a publisher, you know, um, I'm able to print books in a way that would never have been possible ten years ago. You know, I I, I mean, I think. If I'd started 10 years before I did, or maybe 15 years before I did, I would have really, really struggled to actually get anything into existence. Whereas, you know, the, the technology that's available now, it lets you do dice trays, it lets you do decks of cards. You know, you want a deck of cards for D10s? Okay, go ahead. You know, uh, you can print that for a few quid um, and just have that sitting in, sitting in reserve whenever you need it. And uh, yeah, no, it's truly incredible. The same is true for uh, for uh, the tools of ambiance. If um, when I started playing, uh, like John, I started with AD and D. If we wanted to make a, a giant Indiana Jones boulder prop at the table, that was a monumental undertaking. It, it would it would require a lot of work to find the materials and design it and paint it. Now you just buy a giant styrofoam rock on the internet, ship it from Amazon. It's there tomorrow, and suddenly, woo, Indiana Jones at the table. It's awesome. It's just incredible. Um, the, the sheer, the sheer quantity of it is sometimes a little overwhelming. At least it is for me. Do you ever feel that way that you sometimes are, are spoiled for choice? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, yeah, it, you, you know, you, you're going okay. So I've got sound. I've got costumes. I've got props. I've got um, the the lighting that I can control. How am I actually going to make sure when I've got three or four shifts in tone of this session? that everything actually goes perfectly and of course that's where mobile devices controlling it come in to a degree but um you know that there becomes a question of how how much do i actually do and and i i personally find myself pick and choosing i don't you know i don't have ambiance through the entire game when i'm doing a role playing game because it changes too much and if the players do something that's hilarious or really really serious when we're not in a situation that fits that you know suddenly the ambiance is is you know ruining the experience so what i do is i pick specific events during the game and it maybe it's two maybe it's three maybe it's even none um but i i pick specific events that i expect to happen and i plan for those and then i'll have a few contingencies you know, that, okay, well, there might be this way or that way, and I'll try and make sure that a few things are covered. And then barring that, you know, we'll play with a, a sort of more um, neutral ambiance for, for the rest of the time. Uh, because my games, I, I mean, it depends on the game you're playing, it depends on the feel you're trying to do with the session. My sessions tend to have a big variance, you know, there'll be funny bits, there'll be serious bits, and anywhere in the middle. Um, yeah, so... It's kind of interesting because it's really contrasts with what John was saying earlier. Um, for the retail shop, I think you said, John, that your ambience is, is pretty persistent, right? 
you're um, you're using yeah. you're using music and lighting pretty pretty consistently and persistently. You're not varying it from scene to scene. Whenever we do use it, uh, I, that's one of the things in my background. I actually worked and did uh, quite a lot of systems automation for a few years, and uh, so our lighting profiles. You know, if we're in a cavern, say something like the Underdark, where uh, you know, stalactites are constantly causing different color reflections, we'll have LED lights that are constantly fading in and out of different. Uh, spectrum so we don't have to mess with them we just set them once before everything kicks off and just let them roll same with the uh the background track we don't usually tie too many audio cues in there we try to just kind of lay a foundation with the audio tracks and let them roll over the uh, loudspeakers throughout the tournament rooms just those two things alone you know just have a huge impact um and then again you know if we have the terrain available you know just to try and help tie things together um you know, because I'll, if I can get my hands on it, you know, like you said, we are, we are spoiled, you know, with, with so many options available to us. And I'm one of those type of people that if I can get my hands on it, I'm going to use it. So. Okay, we have a uh, question from the, uh, from the chat. Uh, it's, do any of you have an issue of digital props versus physical props in running a game? So, um, Yes. Uh, if I'm running a modern game, digital props are fine. Uh, if I'm running a game that's set in a historical era or a fantasy era or an era where I think the digital prop isn't um, appropriate or is somehow going to break the ambiance in, or instead of enhance it, I, I usually won't allow it. I, uh, I tend to run sci-fi games, so I, I very, very seldom have this problem. Um, in fact, uh, I, I encourage digital props over physical props in in most cases as a result of uh a, exactly the same thing that, that jason's talking about there um it it is a case of you know as long as it fits it's not a problem i i, I think i'd agree with jason i think if i ended up in a situation where i'm doing a fantasy game and you know there was a physical uh sorry a digital prop i might i might kind of think twice I think there is one exception, and that's probably portraits. When you need to show what an NPC or another character looks like, you're almost by default, unless you're going to print everything out on paper, uh, having a monitor or some other digital display set up for that is pretty handy, I have to admit, no matter what the, uh, no matter what the game is. That may even apply to maps as well, to a degree. I'd say anything that you'd expect to yeah. be 2D anyway probably is not too much of a problem so uh as as you say portraits is a very good question uh very very good point uh maps are another thing that you would expect to be 2d on the table and the fact that you have a screen um i've seen i've seen tables with screens in set i think that's actually a, an interesting idea um and, and you've got a screen on the table well it's a 2d image you'd expect a map to be 2d as long as the map is not you know the content of the map is not jarring to the uh genre I'd say that's probably okay as well. Yeah. I mean, we have monitors set up in all of our, uh, you know, game areas. One of them uh, is, you know, right above our, our, our large game table for uh, role-playing games. And so whenever we have something going on, we'll use it as a prop just to kind of rotate out artwork, just, to, you know, nothing that's going to really pull too much attention away from the game, but just kind of artwork rotating away. If we're doing like a haunted house game, you know, we'll have just like portraits hanging up there, you know, that are like looking around, you know, nothing that's really going to divulge and pull away from the table, but kind of add to it. Um, one, the only real digital at a table ambience wise um is sometimes you know you know uh, smartphones you know because in the middle of the game you know some sort of interruption comes up or somebody would be completely invested in their character and then they read something on their phone you know just in the middle of the game it changes their whole attitude because one of the big rules that we try to do is that um you know role playing is kind of an escape from where you currently are for some people and so whenever you bring that you know bring the real world into the game then, you know, it starts to affect the gameplay. It starts to affect everybody's experience and it can ultimately lead a positive game down a very negative road. Do you, um, do you try to deliberately discourage your players from, from using their personal electronics at, while they're role-playing them? I don't really try to, I mean, a lot of, you know, we've got a really good group, you know, at our, at our local games, you know, game store that usually if some sort of interruption comes up, you know, they'll just step aside, you know, 
and so there's really not okay. too much that interferes so, with yeah. the game. So it's kind of a self-policing situation. Yeah, I mean we've got we've got a really good group here, so I'm, I'm fortunate. <laughs> yeah, I, but you had. I have the uh, I have the same thing with my own group. You know, my own group, they're totally fine to use their phone when it's not their combat turn. You know, they know how long it's going to be before it is again. You know, we've been playing together a, a long time, four or five years now. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we know each other pretty well and, and we, we're able to avoid that. At conventions, wow. Um, you know, that's that's one of those places where it's, uh, where it's a very interesting situation because... You've got someone sat at your table, and I'm talking about conventions where you're literally running half-hour demos in the actual main trade hall. You've got someone sat at your table, and, you know, it's their turn and they're using their phone. So what do you say as a GM with someone sat there? Now, personally, I am on the side of, hey, hello, come on, we're, we're playing here, and, you know, you've got to respect the other people at the table. So I usually, you know, encourage people not to pull out their phone and do stuff. There are a couple of exceptions, like when someone's looking for someone else, and yeah, I do much the same thing as, as John was saying, and I ask people to step away from the table if they're going to have to use their phone for an extended period of time. You know, we'll put their character on autopilot, or, or, we'll, or we'll put someone else in charge of their character, just, just temporarily. Um, yeah, I, I think most people, in my experience, get the point if you ask them not to use the phone and you, t and you tell them why. Um, I think most people sort of, as they come into role playing games, no matter how new they are to it, they understand what John was saying, or was it yourself? Um, that this is really all about not being where you are right now. This is about mm -hmm. experiencing something through theater of the mind that you would never experience in day to day life. And if you keep the trappings of day to day life and you keep using it and you sat there on your smartphone the whole time, you're not actually going to experience that. You're not going to enjoy the experience as much overall, and you're really going to miss out on something. And I think that's the fundamental thing that that I, as a GM, try to explain to people in that situation. You are missing out. You know, that I can ignore you and make sure the other people enjoy the game. I don't want you to have to miss out on this and 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 have a bad time. John is smiling. I'm not sure why. Managing a store and, uh, and and participating in the panels. Is, is I, thought, I thought you had a funny. I thought you had a funny uh, cell phone at the table story for us. Uh, no, I mean I've actually worked with a couple of guys. I know a few guys that designed a, a zombie um, a zombie survival role playing game that actually incorporates an application they designed on their smartphones. So they found a they found a good way to kind of tie it together, but uh, still the same way, you know, you're you're kind of relying heavily on a, on a black mirror that can you know pull a negative uh, outer source you know, into your game area. So you know, it's one of those devices you got to be careful with. Yeah, it's, it can be a difficult balance. I agree, uh, especially now that we see uh, the commonality of dice rollers and uh, hmm. PDF based books and character sheets that are all designed to be used on a, an electronic device, a tablet or a cell phone. And so players feel licensed to bring their, their phones to the table because that's where the character sheet is or that's where their dice are now. They don't, they don't have physical dice or physical character sheets or even a physical book. It's on an electronic device. And that, of course, leads to the temptation to check your email or uh, maybe check the, the scores on the latest match or surf the web or chat with a friend. I haven't yet found a good solution for balancing that out, but I think it's going to become more difficult to deal with rather than easier really quickly. I, I think that people will quickly understand that it is a matter of self-interest, to be honest. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll let you... Are you leaving us, John? I think I'll do all right. Yeah, I'm actually gonna gonna bow out. I've got a few events to run today. Uh, I just wanted to drop them here for you know the better part of. I think we've been rolling for about an hour, um, and I've actually got all this streaming in the shop. So if you guys want to say hey to everybody that's in there playing, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was fun talking with you guys. I'm about to uh, probably bow out early and uh, start getting some stuff running here, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys either at one of the game tables throughout the day or probably tomorrow uh we're, we're actually running a demo tomorrow morning cool nice thanks so much john for joining us yes thanks.
Thank yeah, you, and a pleasure to meet you. Great you to meet man. you. Really nice to talk to you. Thanks. Y'all have a good day. And then there were two. Oh no, one of us being picked off already. Wait, is this an attempt to create ambiance in our panel? <laughs> Great, no, one told me, no, no one told me it was this type, kind of convention. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, is there a particular kind of um, prop or other piece of ambiance that you were surprised at either how well or how not well it went over with players? Wow, what a great question. Um, a couple of times, I have an example of both. Um, I, um, I decided that um, during a Dungeons and Dragons game, um, the characters were going to meet uh, a king. And I debated whether or not I should, you know, put on a crown or, you know, indicate physically that they're meeting with a king, somebody of great authority. This is important. They should take it seriously. And I worried that maybe adding physical props like that would make it silly or funny or they might laugh. And uh, they didn't. I found a really cool crown and a, and a great cloak and uh, put it on and it went great. They, they instantly treated the king with, with respect and, and uh, uh, it was a great scene. I was very surprised. I was nervous. I didn't want to look too goofy, but um, it worked. And then at one point I, uh, I built a prop. I built a um, it's kind of a, a, an acrylic crystal with uh, some phosphorescent material in it that would glow. And I thought that would be really cool because it looked eerie and scary and they just laughed at it. They thought it was ridiculous. It looked like some sort of cheap Halloween store prop. So I was very disappointed, but there you go. I, not, I, not, not every, not every attempt at ambiance is going to work. No, that's, and, and actually, yeah, if, if there's anyone listening who's thinking, oh yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do some of this stuff. One piece of advice that I would really give you as someone who's, you know, tried to do some ambiance it won't always work. Um, in fact, the uh, the second time, the first time I used the soundtrack, it worked brilliantly. The second time I used the soundtrack, it totally flopped. It was it was uh, it was the right choice. It induced the right emotional state in me, um, and unfortunately, it completely did not work with the players. So the one piece of advice I would give is. Don't assume if you get it wrong once, even if it's the first time or the second time or the third time, don't assume that you're doing the wrong thing. Keep trying, keep trying to improve. Ask people why they thought it didn't work. I mean, as, as Jason said, the reason that they laughed at his prop was because it looked like a cheap Halloween store thing. Uh, hey, I mean, that's not what you thought. That's not the way that you felt when you made it. And, you know, that's fine. You can only do the best that you can do. And what will happen is, as you gain experience in trying to do it, you will gradually improve. Um, and you will gradually learn, with any given group, that this works well and this works less well. I think that's great advice. Uh, keep trying until you find the level of, of, of ambience that works for you and your players. And if something's not working, it's perfectly okay to talk about it. Yeah. To Don't make sure be that everybody is getting the same why. expectations. Yeah. And also bear in mind that each group probably will have slightly different expectations. So just because it oh, works yeah. for one group, I mean, your king stunt, as you say, some people would have loved it. great for that group. For another it group, for that it group. might have just been a Burger King crown. Who knows? It, indeed. Indeed. And and they might not have taken it at all seriously. But it worked at all. You know, you, you can never 100% know. You can know the people very well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know how they're going to behave as a group especially when you start to introduce new things that you've never done before. So even if you're playing with a group for 5, 10, 15 years, if you've never done ambiance stuff and then you suddenly introduce it, maybe they'll like it, oh. maybe they won't. The effect could be jarring. Uh, yeah. Once once you start to get outside of what uh, once you start to get outside of expectations, things can get uh, can get difficult very fast, it's true. Mm -hmm. I like to I like to sit down with my players and um, talk about everybody's expectations for the game, for the table, for the level of ambiance. Kind of get our social contract together before we start playing. But um, I think you're I think you're right. I think checking in with people every 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 so often is a good idea too to make sure that everything is still working.
got a, another yep. question from chat. Oh, unless you had more on that. Um, so if you were given the choice to literally step into another gaming realm for a month, uh, be it one you created or a personal favorite, what game would it be and what kind of character would you be? Great question. Uh, I, I, I can answer that pretty easily. Um, the, the first game that I created, Era of the Consortium, is my personal favorite game. Um, and I would absolutely step into that realm, but only at one specific time in the timeline because most of most of that timeline 500 years of history is pretty brutal there's only one place i'd want to be and that's in the point where they call time of enlightenment where um you know it is it is a it is a moment where humanity really comes together they begin to understand that you know it's more than just humanity there are alien species as well out there um, you know, there's true enlightenment, uh, the corporate interests back off a bit, and, uh, you know, there, there's actually a, a brief period of a, a true utopian society. And I think that would be very interesting to experience, uh, just once in my life. That'd be cool. You might get the chance, you never know, where technology is progressing really Who fast. Knows? Uh, that's a great question, um. When I think back on all the great uh, campaigns and campaign settings that I've enjoyed, both those that I've created myself and those that um, other brilliant minds have created, having to choose just one to visit to become part of is, is it's almost an unfair question. Wow. Um, but I think I'm going to choose a game from the world of darkness, unsurprisingly. I'm going to choose... Um, the Sorcerer's Crusade, which was the Mage the Ascension setting for the Renaissance, Renaissance Europe. And it was a time when old ideas were being challenged by brand new ideas. Science and religion were clashing. Um, deeply held beliefs and moral ethics were being challenged by new humanism. It was a very exciting time. It was the age of discovery. We were learning about the world for the first time beyond uh, beyond our shores. Well, um, you know the um, the excitement of it and the uh, the artistic explosion to be have to have been a, a mage a wielder of magic at that time I think would have been extraordinary. So I, I'm going to pick that. Nice. Well, we're getting towards the end of our panel here. Was there another topic or uh, question that you guys wanted to wanted to tackle before we end end it? I think I'd like to conclude just by saying that uh, for those game masters who've never tried ambiance before, never tried music or lighting or costumes or props or whatever, um, I would encourage them to give it a try. And like my colleagues have said, uh, if you're at all nervous about it, talk to your players first. Let them know what you're going to do and get their get their buy-in or get their uh, opinions about it. Um, because I think that. I haven't ever been in a situation where adding a little ambiance to the experience has detracted from it. I might be alone among the panelists in that, but uh, I've always found that even just a little bit enhances the experience um, considerably. You get a you get a lot of return for your even a little investment. Yeah, uh, I would I would absolutely echo that. Uh, although I'd add one one extra thing, um, which is start slow. Start slow. Start with one thing. Choose one Good event point. that you want to put some music around or, you know, have a prop for, uh, like the King example is a good example. Um, show your players that it's okay. Um, find out, you know, gauge their reaction, you know, uh, talk to them afterwards. What did you think? You know, did you think that worked? Do you think I should do some more? Do you think, you know, one time, you know, at the climactic event of, of every session, you know, do you think I should continue to do this? I think you'll find that what they'll say is yes. I think they'll I think they'll say, yep, yeah, I think, you know, as long as you don't overdo it, I think you'll find that they will say, yes, I enjoyed that. Um, I was, you know, I didn't feel like it detracted from the gameplay at all. In fact, it, it drew me in that little bit further. Uh, that was certainly my experience the first time I tried it. And, uh, and yeah, start slow. And I don't think that you'll have a problem. If you go ahead and, and um, as, uh, as John was saying at the beginning... Um, you know, you, you turn up in full costume and everyone's kind of looking at you and going, nah, we kind of don't do that. So, yeah, that, you know, give them the opportunity to adapt to steps. 
right? And let, let them remember that it's about them and about improving their experience is the reason that you're doing this. And as long as you do that for this reason, that's the right reason, and I don't think you'll ever regret it. Well said. Thank you for that. Um, is there, uh, what kind of games are you guys currently playing or working on right now? Whoever you want to take that question. Sure. I'm working on uh, Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition with White Wolf. We have a, a development team um, that's been working on it this year, and uh, you'll see it next year, sometime next year. Uh, in fact, if anybody who is uh, watching uh, is going to be at Penny Arcade Expo Unplugged, PAX Unplugged, next week in Philadelphia, you'll be able to playtest Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition with us. We'll have the White Wolf team there. Uh, I, I personally, I, I'd just like to say I'm I'm personally looking forward to that. I won't be at PAX, of course, because I live in England, oh. but uh, I, I'm personally looking forward to, to VTM 5th Edition. I think that's going to be awesome. Um, Thank you. What I'm working on, I'm working on, um, right now I've got an active Kickstarter for uh, expansions to the sci-fi universe that I mentioned before. Uh, we ran one a year ago and unlocked eight expansions. Uh, we've already funded this one, which unlocks three, and each stretch goal unlocks a new one. Um, I'm actually also working on nine other projects. So I won't list them all. Um, if you want to know more about it, um, you should come to our, uh, our thing at the end of Sunday. Uh, where actually I'll be sitting down with some of my team uh, to talk about them. But um, the very near future ones, I'm working on a superhero game, uh, which I've actually been working on for about two years. And I've had people who keep coming back to me at conventions and go, Has, have you finished Era of the Empowered yet, Ed? Have you finished it yet? Um, and I'm finally going to finish it uh, and release it early next year, I'm hoping. Um, I've also got actually a horror game, um, which uh, uh, called Era of the Chosen. Um, which uh, which I'm also working on on a similar timescale early next year. Um, as I said, I've got loads, loads more projects, but um, they all run on the same rule set, uh, which, if you are familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, uh, won't be too hard to learn. It does use multiple D10s, um, and it uh, it uses some of the best rules uh, from from that particular uh, rule set, and uh, I uh, I then changed some of the stuff that didn't work for me. So uh, Ed, I'm me. always working. <laughs> Did you did you say you had nine projects? I have nine current games underway. Yeah. When do you sleep? I don't. No. Do um, in seriousness, I'm a project manager uh, in software development for my day job. Mm. Um, so I'm very very good at juggling. Um, you get very very good at juggling when you have to manage forty developers all doing their own mm -hmm. thing and, and making sure that all the projects come in on time. So, uh, you know, I've got, I've got years and years of experience doing that, uh, which, yeah, no, if I'm honest, without that, I could never hope to do what I'm doing. It's <laughs> really impressive. Nice. And we just got a couple more minutes and uh, we have one more question from uh, Chef Pug. Thanks for asking all these great questions. Have you ever used live animals in creating ambiance? I know who this individual is, so I'll, 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 I'll allow other people to answer this question first. Not deliberately. <laughs> Accidentally? Um, well, there's always the odd cat or dog that finds its way into the scenario. And I was, um, I was running the original Ravenloft and uh, we turned the lights down and it was very spooky and we had spooky music and um, this, uh, Count Strahd the vampire was about to strike and the cat got into it and uh, jumped out of, from a great height onto the middle of the gaming table scattering the dice and books and everybody shrieked and it was very exciting so completely unplanned guest star appearance by the cat at the most opportune moment uh, but I think that was the only time at which a live animal was used. I uh, I actually have two stories. Um, one of which is from yesterday, and one of which is secondhand from this individual who asked the question. So it's your fault, George. It's your fault. Um, uh, what One of the ways we were actually talking about how you create ambiance for a horror game yesterday, as it happens... Um, this was after the game that I just run uh, with a few uh, with a few friends, old and new. And um, what one of the things was, uh, you know, that that overhead they had a single spotlight. They turned off all the other lights in the house, 
and they let the cats loose. And and they were doing a spooky game, you know, they were wandering around, and then you hear a cat break something upstairs. Uh, okay, fine, the cat broke something, but it's definitely adding to the ambiance, which is a very interesting, interesting technique. You've you got you got cats running past your legs at the uh, at sort of the uh, the the spooky moments. As long as you are lucky and time it right, that's I thought that was quite an interesting idea. Um, the second one that I uh, have actually experienced where someone used a, a live animal as a prop was in fact yesterday uh, during this game that I just mentioned where um, uh, I should explain a little bit about Eralize just to qualify this answer. Um, you are not adventurers. Uh, you are pretending to be adventurers and uh, you know pretending that all kinds of magical things may or may not have happened to you. Um, this individual was clearly a very disturbed ventriloquist who... Um, spoke uh the dog spoke and the human didn't uh so yeah he'd literally hold his dog and the dog would speak um and uh yes this this particular individual used uh used the uh the dog as a prop for almost the entire game <laughs> i certainly think it has the virtue of never having been done before <laughs> i don't know if it's something that's very portable though uh, nor do I. I. I don't own a dog, but uh, it was certainly very memorable for me. Well, I think that about wraps up our questions, unless there's anything else you wanted to, to add in these last couple of minutes. No, I think we should end on the dog. I really do. I, I, I agree. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to say That's thank perfect. you very much for listening to us talk for ooh, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I hope we gave a little bit of insight. I hope that um, we uh, gave some interesting food for thought, at least. Thanks very much for having us and for uh, moderating the panel as well. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much for being a part of it. This has been Ed Jowett and Jason Carl and also earlier John McNabb for the uh, Propping It Up, How to Create Ambiance at Your Table panel session.